Welcome to lecture 15. In this lecture, we're going to apply the principles we learned in the last lecture um, to a couple of new situations. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to jump and we're going to land. And we're going to pretend we're going to land on a scale, like a kitchen scale. And we'll see what happens there. And we're then going to ride an elevator. And again, we pretend we're like standing on a scale and it's going to do what it's going to do. And we'll, we'll figure that one out. Um, and then we're going to want to talk about ramps. Now, when I say a ramp, you might visualize some kind of, you know, plank of wood down the the, the back of a of a lorry or something. But uh, yes, that is a ramp. But in general, I mean, any time you're on some kind of incline or any object is sitting on an incline, we're going to have a situation where the stuff we're going to be studying here applies. It's kind of this the start of this somewhat peculiar journey. Um, through having inclines at various angles with friction, without friction, with things moving, with things not moving, with things spinning, um, and so on. So this is kind of very important um, in itself, just because there are so many um, applications of, of the basic ideas that we develop here. Before we get there, let's start with those. Yep. So let's imagine you jump and you land in a bathroom scale. So here's my um, here's my comic version of this. Now actually, if you have the chance, why not go do it? Right now, post the video, get out of the bathroom scale, do this experiment. Um, maybe don't jump at it too hard, you don't want to break it, make it a little sort of hop maybe, I and mean, then look carefully what happens. So here I imagine we are running, we're jumping onto the scale, flying through the air, a landing on the scale and then we just stay there for a while. So I just want to analyze the forces. Now actually the first two are sort of a bit boring really because I mean you're not touching the scale, nothing's going to happen. Right? But it's sort of free body di diagram in each case um, for you here. So here you're jumping off and you're still touching the ground though, you're on the ground. So at this point I might I might draw your free body diagram as having a, a weight mg down and a normal force from the ground so f n with the ground ground up now if i'm pushing off actually your normal force is going to be a bit bigger than your weight if it's the instant of jumping up if you're jumping forward there's a friction but let's not worry about that too much right now. Um, you're flying through the air. While you're flying, of course, you're in free fall. It's projectile motion, but there's sideways in the horizontal direction. You're just going at a constant velocity. Um, so it's just the weight in this case. Or it's the only force acting on you. Um, still, our bathroom scale shows, of course, zero. Because you're not standing on it. Um, you can write scale shows zero. Right? Obviously, you're not touching. It's a bit silly, really. Right? Now it gets interesting. Now we are landing on it. So this is the point of landing. Well, while I'm landing on it, right, I have downward velocity goes to zero velocity. Right? Because I jumped and I came down. The sideways motion will stop by friction. We'll talk about that another time. But the downwards motion. Write this out. Downwards motion becomes well zero motion. So we must have an upwards acceleration. Right, upwards acceleration. So that means the normal force on you has to be bigger than your weight, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't start accelerating upwards. If those two were equal, then you'd keep falling at a constant speed. You could get drag the scale with you, um, but here it has to look like this. Here, of course, the normal force with the scale. Now, now you're touching the scale. What is the scale showing? You say it, show, it shows my weight. It says so in pounds, maybe even. Um, goodness. 
Now, of course, it's not showing you that. How would it know what your weight is? Your weight is an interaction between you and the Earth. The scale has no clue what you and the Earth are doing. What the scale is showing you is how hard you push down on it. Never mind that pounds is also mass, not a weight. Um, or depending on how you use, you use the word pound. It's rather confusing. Let's stick with metric units. Um, you're, you, while you're landing on it, right? You're squeezing down on the scale. Now, if you just take a kitchen scale and you just push down on it with your hand, it's going to show you a reading that has nothing to do with the mass of anything of you, of an object that you might want to, you know, measure the mass of. No, what the scale measures is the normal force on it. Let's write this down. Scale measures. normal force on it. Now we know that the normal force of the scale on you is greater than um, than mg, right? And then that means that you are also pushing down on the scale with a force that's equal to this, but downwards that is Newton's third law, of course. So the scale is going to show this normal force here um, it has a reading that is that is greater than mg, greater than the weight, right? So if you have a normal scale that shows you something in pounds or kilograms, then um, literally what, what it does, it is, well, literally it shows you a normal force, but then in, so in newtons, but then the number gets divided by 9.8, so it shows, gives you a number back that corresponds to kilograms. Um, but if you're pushing down with, say, 30 newtons, the scale might show you 3 kilograms. So while you're landing, the force down is greater than the weight, therefore the scale gives you a reading that's greater than the weight, because the, the scale measures essentially this, or rather its third low partner force. Now we're standing on it, maybe a few seconds later. Um, so here, there's no acceleration. Zero normal force, sorry, zero um, net force. So we're again in this simple balance scenario where the weight is equal to the normal force. Normal force, normal interaction with the scale. And so that's what the scale shows. The reading of the scale is now equal to your weight. Or if it's a normal scale, like you might buy in a store, it will not show you a force in newtons. It'll just divide by 9.8, um, and and that's that. Okay, so now um, one thing for you to think about is um, what if you stood on a scale on the moon? What would you see then? I'm going to leave this for you to figure out. Okay, so take a moment, pause the video, think about it, and then we'll do the next example. Here's our next example. So let's imagine you stand inside an elevator on a scale. Could be the sort of normal um, bathroom scale, or maybe, you know, some special scale that's hooked up to a computer where it shows you continuously um, what the weight is, and maybe let's just pretend for simplicity that it actually shows you the force in newtons. Um, rather than, you know, in, in kilograms or pounds, like it normally would when it um, translates the, uh, the the normal force to a mass, right? Of course, only works on Earth. Um, okay, so let's imagine we stand in a scale inside an elevator, and we're going to start the timer as the doors close. Right, and then we'll see the weight shown on the scale is, is what this we have in this graph here. I say weight shown, of course, we know now actually it's showing us the normal force. Right, so I've sort of actually indicated that already here. Right, this is you might put this into I mean, the comma. So here's what we're trying to find out from the graph Is the elevator going up or down? What's my mass? And what's the acceleration of the elevator? Let's interpret this. So 
the doors close at time equals zero, right? So my time axis is here, so it's zero, one second, two seconds, and so on. So let's label these different um, these different points in time, right? So right at zero, the doors close. That's what we were told. Doors close. So then here we see that the that the um, the elevator just just nothing seems to happen, right? So the scale I set, I'm setting on the scale it shows a constant um, 500 newtons. So that suggests to me that here, right, nothing has happened yet. The elevator is is waiting, I suppose. Let's call it that. Um, so elevator is waiting. Or maybe. No, it's, it's not moving yet. So it's this part here. Right. And here what we have is that the weight must be equal to the normal force, because if it wasn't, then we'd be accelerating, which we're not. In fact, what tells me that nothing's happening here is one is just understanding the situation. Look, the doors have just closed. The other thing is, I see this is kind of the baseline, and then there's this bump here and this bump here. Um, but the most of the time, right, we're going to be at 500. Um, you'll see how it all fits together when we're done with it. Um, wait, and then the normal force. So, my weight, of course, is equal to mg. My normal force, in this case here, we can read off it is 500 newtons. Here those two are equal. A, the acceleration is zero. The net force is zero. And so I can conclude that my weight is also 500 newtons. And it would suggest that my mass is 50 kilograms because 50 times 10, 50 times g makes 500. Um, so, so my mass here is m equals 50 kilogram. How did I figure this out? Well, I figured it out by looking at those, those segments where I can see that, uh, like, where we're just waiting, right? Just waiting here. I'll tell you what these other segments correspond to in just a minute. So is the elevator going up or down? Well, what's happening next? At two seconds now, the normal force is greater than than the baseline. The baseline equal to the weight. So here, it must be accelerating because your weight hasn't changed. Let's see what color am I going to use for this. Um, the elevator accelerating. Right, it's this section here between, I guess, two and four seconds. Right? How do I know this? Well, in this case, the normal force is bigger than the than the average. So it will look something like, I keep my color coding of the forces. I'm not going to write down normal force and weight every time now because we're just going to use the same colors for them. It will look like this. And here we're going to have um, a net force that's positive. So the force upwards is bigger than down. So um, normal force is greater than the weight. And so what this is telling me is that the net force is up. Right, it's up. So therefore, the, acceler the elevator is accelerating upwards. So A is also up, and so I know that the, the elevator must be going up. Right, because my first acceleration is upwards, because the normal for the ground is pushing harder against my feet than is just needed to support my weight. So then we reach this long stretch here, along the middle, um, where again, the normal force is five back to 500, 
So here we have no acceleration. So that means we're just cruising. The cruising is a term that's used to refer to a motion with a constant velocity. Right? So along here, along this segment, again, the two forces, the normal force and the weight, they're going to be equal. Let me make a note of this, that they're equal in magnitude, opposite in direction. So there's zero net force. zero acceleration but we were accelerating upwards so now we're just cruising moving upwards so we're kind of traveling here if you imagine here the normal force was greater so this is where you felt heavier right and then we reach this section here um, and now so your weight doesn't change but suddenly you have less normal force on you that means um, the elevator must again be accelerating elevator accelerating now I say accelerating but in this case actually it's going to be a negative um, acceleration because what I have is that the normal force is smaller that's what the graph shows me right the graph shows me the normal force it's going to look something like like this because the weight is always meant to be the same size right with the normal force to change the size now I have that the weight is greater than the normal force and so I can see um, that the net force is down so the acceleration is down um, and so because I was going up well that means we're now slowing down Okay, and then we come to the last segment here, and this last segment here, I guess we're we're just waiting again. Um, so it's kind of the same thing as right at the beginning, right? We've we've stood there doing nothing. We've accelerated for a while, we're going at a constant speed. We are having a negative acceleration. This is where I feel especially light, and then we're waiting again. Um, that's exactly as before, and the doors open, and then what? What's this weird bump? Well, that's just sort of added for good measure. The weird bump probably means we're stepping off the scale. And stepping off the scale means we need to push, push, our foot pushes down so we can move our body sort of upwards. Um, that's where the little bump comes from. Then we're off the scale. The scale reading goes to zero. Step off scale. That's this bump at the end. It's not very, um, you know, it's just rough. It's going to look something like that. So the one thing we haven't answered yet is what is the acceleration of the elevator? Well, we figured out the mass, right? The mass has to be the weight equal to the weight. Where, sorry, the, um, the mass times gravity equals the weight. And that is equal to normal force in those sections here where we are waiting. Going with a constant velocity, we're waiting again. So now that I know that, I can figure out what's the net force. Um, well, where I'm going to squeeze that, I'm going to squeeze in the corner down here. So A, while accelerating, is going to be equal to the net force over the mass. Right, that's Newton's second law. Um, the net force here, say, is going to be, um, the color code this, 600 newtons. Then I have to subtract the weight. The weight is 500 newtons, right? We figured that out because the weight is equal to normal force here and here. Um, we divide, of course, by the mass. The mass we figured out was 50 kilograms. Um, so 100, 600 minus 500 is 100 divided by 50. That makes 2 meters per second squared as my answer um, for the acceleration. Again, take this example, make sure you understand every part of this graph. Um, maybe, you know, plot it in yourself. Maybe also think about what would the graph look like if the elevator were going down. Um, 
Another thing you can figure out from this graph that I haven't done here, it's a little bit of a fun little review to do, is how much altitude, how much height, how much in a vertical distance did the elevator gain during this ride? So you can figure that one out. Just from this graph, you've put everything you need um, on this graph, just looking at the scale inside the elevator. The last example I'm going to look at is the one of a frictionless ramp. And that's going to be our base sort of example for a whole bunch of other scenarios where we have friction and various other things going on with objects sitting on an incline, right? So it's, it could be the side of a hill, it doesn't matter what it is, but somewhere along the way there's this section here and here's my block, some object, it's sitting on this incline and the incline here is an angle theta with the horizontal. So what are the forces acting? What's going to happen in this scenario? Well, there is the weight, right? The weight is there, otherwise it would be sitting there, it'd be floating around in space. And the weight is, of course, equal to mg. Next thing is just the normal force. The normal force is normal. So it is perpendicular to the surface so it must be at an angle, it must be like this. It's not straight up, and that's crucial to understand. I want to abbreviate it Fn. Right, so that's my normal force, right? It has to be normal because that's how normal forces work. If I wanted a force that's along the, the side of the hill, like parallel to the hill, I'd need friction. And right now we're going to assume this is frictionless, maybe it's covered in a sheet of ice, or something like that. So, are there any other forces? Well, I don't see any other interactions, right? It's not electrically charged, there are no springs attached, no strings attached, um, there's no, no magnets, not, nothing, you know, there's nothing else there to interact with the block. So I know that those are the only forces, right? This is not something I figure out from say knowing the motion, I don't know the motion, but it's something I can I can look at. Is there anything else that's interacting with this block? The answer is no. So those are my only two forces. Now you can see right away that they can't possibly cancel out. Right? Because they're in different directions. They're not along a line. So there's no way, however long this one is, it's not going to cancel out this arrow here. Now we can anticipate a little bit what the motion is going to be, right? We know this block cannot possibly take off into space, right? Because as soon as it left the surface, there'd be no normal force, it would just be falling down. It can't possibly get pushed and take off. It also is not digging itself into the ground. So we know that the motion of the block will be parallel to to the incline, to the ramp. Right, it'll be up or down, and you probably guess it's going to be down. Um, so from that we can infer already that the um, that the net force is going to be down the hill. Let me just show you how that comes about if I just add the forces. So I add the forces, so I add the, the weight, and to the weight I'm going to add my normal force. I add forces tip to tail. And so what I'm going to be left with is the net force here, F net, the sum of the forces as vectors, right, pointing down the hill. So now I look at the scenario and I say, okay, I've got, I've got three quantities to worry about. There are two forces, but then there's also their sum, the net force. And I can see that the net, the normal force is perpendicular to the hill. The net force is parallel to the hill and the weight is straight down. So to analyze those, I'm going to choose a coordinate system that aligns with two of the forces. So let me put it like this. So we want to pick a coordinate system. Take a cord system, right? And so the two obvious choices would be the sort of standard 
vertically horizontal. Or maybe I can do one that might make sense where I'm inclining my axes. I'm going to call those x and y, right? I might have called this x bar, y bar, but because I'm only picking one in the end, I can I can call those I can either one x and y, right? I'm only going to use one. Which one are we going to use? Well, in this one here, I'll have my forces are going to look like this. This one will be well behaved. This one is not well behaved. I mean, it's at some angle. And this one, the net force. I'm not going to draw it right here because it's not an extra force. But it's, it's sort of at an angle like this, the net force. So two of the forces have components. All right. Hmm. Um, I guess we can deal with that if we have to, right? Okay, here, the weight is down. Okay, the weight is, is not along an axis. Hmm. But my other two quantities are that the normal force is. And then the net force. Again, I'm not going to touch it here because it's not an additional force. It's just the sum of all of them um, points this way. So only one of them, one of those three quantities I have to worry about actually has components. And so I want to use this coordinate system here. You can do all the analysis in here. It's not a problem. It just takes a bit longer. It's a bit more algebraically um, involved because more like two of the vectors you're dealing with will have components here. Only one of them does. So let's pick this one here to go with it. Okay, so you have an x and a y direction, right? So let me just redraw this picture again. Um, so I have an incline here. I've got an angle of the inclination here, I've got my block of mass here, and then I have a, a normal force that's sort of like this, Fn, at a slight angle, it could be a steep angle, and I've got a weight down, that's mg, and the net force I know is going to be in this direction. So what we need to do, my x-axis is going to be going to be down the hill, and my y-axis is going to be like this, and this should be like along the y-axis. Okay. So I those this one here, F n, right, um, only has a y component, and net force only has an x component. Um, it's the it's the weight that has components in both directions. Let's figure out what those components are, and to do that, we need to do a little bit of a little bit of geometry. So this is the weight zoomed in, right? It's bigger now. Weight. Um, it has components that are in the y direction and in the x direction. X. To find those, well, it's like how long, how far do I have to go along the x direction, and how far do I have to go along the y direction? Those are going to be my x and the y components, or I could be going this way first. You could go along the y axis first, and then the x axis. Doesn't matter which way you pick. Um, so this is going to be the x component of the weight. And this is going to be the y component of the weight. Maybe confused how, but I thought the weight doesn't have an x component. Well, that is not true. The, the weight does because x and y are not just per, are not just horizontal and vertical. When y is perfectly vertical, then all the weight is in the y direction and there's nothing in the x direction because it's horizontal. But weight acts down. Doesn't matter what you label your axes, how you direct them. It acts down, and in this case, down involves bit in this direction, bit in this direction. Sometimes it can help if you sort of tilt your page like this. Um, so you sort of make the hill flat, and then you can see that this vector here needs an x component and a y component. Uh, but I, I, I mean, you can do it. I'd rather you 
don't because it sort of suggests that I can only deal with coordinate systems if they point straight up and sideways and I'd rather tilt the universe the way point gravity pointing this way now rather than straight down um, than my axes but it can be helpful to sort of visualize like how the components lie along the axis um, okay so so what's what are the angles involved here well, the angle with the horizontal is theta, right? So I can actually just draw this horizontal anywhere. Let's draw it here. This was theta. Now, this is 90 degrees because the weight is straight down. That makes this angle here 90 minus theta. And this angle here is also 90 degrees, right? Because it's the two axes are perpendicular to each other. The x component is perpendicular to the y component. Uh, so this is 90 minus theta. This is 90. So that means this angle down here in the green triangle, this again has to be theta as well. And from this, I can then write down what the components are. Because, because the weight, the x component, of the weight is going to be equal to this part here. This is a right angle triangle. I'm looking at this green triangle here. It's the opposite of the angle that is theta. So this is going to be mg, because the weight itself is, of course, magnitude mg, sine theta, and the y component of the weight is well, it's this part here. And I can see this is the hypotenuse of the triangle. That's the actual vector. Those are the two components. Um, this is theta. It's the adjacent. So it's the cosine. Now, there are other ways to do the geometry to arrive at the same result. Um, but these are then the, the, the crucial insights. Where theta is the angle with the horizontal? If we'd been given the angle with the vertical of the incline, well, then the story would be different. But you know how to do this geometry, how to figure out angles from triangles. Right? Okay, so now we're able to write down the what happens in each direction. Right? Um, let me start a new page here. So in the x direction, let's down the hill. Um, let me make a little table maybe. So I have to wait. I have the normal force and I have um, the net force, that's just the sum of the two, the vector sum. And in the x direction, the weight is plus mg sine theta. Right, because it's it's in the forward direction. It pulls gravity pulls me this way. It's down the hill. That's what I call the the x direction points down the hill, as shown up here. Okay. The normal force is zero because I picked my coordinate system explicitly to make that true. And so then the net force must be. It follows that net force is mg sine theta because it's just the weight. In the y direction, we have the weight acts also in the y direction. It's minus mg cosine theta. Why is it minus? Well, let's have a look. The axis, the y-axis points out of the hill, but the weight pulls me down, specifically in the y direction, pulls me like in this direction, into the hill. That's why there's a minus sign there. Um, the normal force is is unknown right but i know that the net force must be zero um, since zero acceleration in the y direction right because the block can't take off or dig into the ground the normal force takes care of that so that implies then this one must be equal to plus mg cosine theta.
Okay, so I hope that makes sense. So the logic is different in the x and the y direction, right? We've worked out what the weight is in each case just from the geometry from understanding gravity. But in the x direction, we know that the normal force is zero. So we were able to infer the net force is just equal to the weight because it's the only force in that direction. In the y direction, we have initially no clue what the normal force is, but we know the net force is zero because we know that from the motion, we put zero acceleration in that direction. So we have, um, so that means the normal force must cancel out the weight. The only way it can do that is if it's plus mg cosine theta that exactly cancels out this. And so then we can actually work out what's the final acceleration. A, well, A, Y, we know is zero. Duh, we knew that, right? But what, what about the X direction? Well, it's the net force in the X direction divided by the mass. It's a vector. I can take components, net force still a vector, divided by the mass, Newton's second law. Um, so I'm going to get M, G, sine theta divided by M, and that leaves me with g sine theta, and it might actually be a result you've met before. I'm doing your homework in kinematics and stuff sliding down ramps, but now we understand where it comes from. Right, it's from the fact that gravity pulls you down, but only at an angle, so you have to take a component, and the component of the weight that points down the hill. All right, so make sure you study this example carefully. Because we're going to be coming back to it, we're going to add friction to it, we're going to add motion, and we upwards, downwards, um, maybe have it be part of, sort of a, a, a banked road where this thing goes on a curve like this. So we'll meet this again, so make sure you understand the geometry, you understand the logic, um, you understand normal forces and weight and net force and all of that. Okay. Well, that's it um, for this. We're going to come, we're going to now move on to talk about friction. So I will see you in the next video.